can I create constructors and destructors in C? You might think the answer is no, but well, let's talk about it. Welcome back everybody. Today we are talking about constructors, destructors, and whether or not you can get constructor and destructor-like functionality in C. The short answer is no, yes, sort of. The long answer is the rest of the video. This video will contain source code, and as always, source code is available through Patreon for those of you that don't want to type along with me. And of course, yes, some of you will notice there is some new facial hair. It's for a play I was in. Does it look villainous? Anyway, um, I'm not sure if it'll stick around, but uh, it's here for now. And also, I'm wearing someone else's merch. I've recently been talking with the folks at GiveInternet.org. They are a nonprofit trying to make the world a better place through technical literacy and access to computing resources, specifically the internet. They are not paying me to say any of this. I just like what they're doing. Also, there is a link down in the description. If you want to help them out, if you want to make any donations, any donations made through that link up to uh, $30,000 will be matched by another donor, so that's pretty cool. But now, back to constructors. So if you're looking for constructors and de Structures, chances are you've seen these in other languages, probably object-oriented languages, and you're wondering if I can get something similar for my programs written in C. Now, if we are talking about Java or Ruby or C++, a constructor is just a method that is automatically run when an object is first created, and a destructor is a method that is run when an object is destroyed or deallocated, but destroyed just sounds more exciting, right? In C, of course, we don't have classes, we don't even have real objects. Well, I guess that it really depends on how you're going to define object. We can create functions that allocate memory and initialize that memory, and we can make functions that deallocate memory, and so that's kind of constructor or destructor-like behavior. But in C, we have to call those functions explicitly. They're not going to be called automatically, which is what happens in a lot of your object-oriented languages. Now, we could do, and I've seen some people do some really funky stuff with preprocessor magic to try to make this kind of automatic behavior work. Let me know down in the comments if you want to see a video on that some point in the future. It's kind of fun, not something I use in my regular projects, but yeah, it might be might make a fun video. But today I want to show you something that I have actually used in real projects. It is a constructor of sorts, not for individual objects or classes, but for modules and libraries. It's also not super portable. It's going to work for GCC and Clang, so if you're using those, which most people are, you're going to be fine. But if you're using some other compiler, this may not work for you. So consider yourself warned. But now let's take a look at some code. So in this program, I have a a main program here in this example.c, and I have two modules, module one and module two. Now these could be anything. To keep this simple, these examples are just going to print a few messages. So they're not, they're not doing anything real in these modules. I just want to show you how you could tie some modules together and how this relates to constructor-like functionality. Because this is a common pattern that you see in programs. Maybe we have separate modules for different libraries. They handle a specific part of the program. Maybe they handle a device or a, a particular, like maybe you've got an encryption module or a compression module or something like that. And of course, these don't do this, but you could have one module call another module. That, so you could have dependencies between modules and maybe we'll get to that later in the video. Now in this case, and this is a common pattern you'll see, each module has a .h file. That's going to specify the interface to the module, basically the, the public stuff that you can call. And then they will also have a .c file. This is where the actual implementation of these functions are going to reside. Now, of course, you can also have header-only libraries. That's something we could talk about in a future video, but that's not for today. Also, it's really common that modules sometimes need initialization. Now, whenever you can, you probably want to do your initialization statically because then it just happens at the very beginning when everything is loaded up. But sometimes you can't, and so one example, one common example I see is maybe you have some sort of dynamic memory allocation or some kind of setup that you're not actually gonna know what it needs to look like until your program actually runs. So, you know, like here I just have, I'm allocating some memory, it's just an integer, so this is just for example purposes, but there are a lot of cases in real software modules where there's initialization that has to happen and until you actually run, you can't just statically allocate allocate the memory or uh, set up the code in whatever way it needs to be set up. So the idea here is pretty simple. Anyone who wants to use this module, so if we look over an example.c, anyone that wants to use module one needs to call the module one underscore init function before calling any of module one's 
functions. Because otherwise we might not have properly set things up for module one. So, you know, module one do stuff, which like I said, in this case, it just mostly prints stuff out. But in a real application, this might mean that your data structures aren't set up. Maybe you've got some pointers that are uninitialized that could result in seg faults or other kinds of crashes or just confusing results. And so that's really what we're working with here. We've got two modules. Basically, I've got a main program here that is using both modules and initializing both modules first. And so just to make sure everything is working, let's just come down here and compile it. You'll notice that it's compiling it in three different, on well, a few different stages. So each of the three different translation units are being compiled independently. And then you have everything linked together in one final stage that's right here. Okay, and if we run it, you can see that we get what we're expecting, right? So we have our main. So if we if we look here, trace, we get main started and main done. Those are showing up right here. Main started, main done. And then each of our modules, we get an init message when it is initialized. And then we get a message when we actually call its do stuff function. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Now let's say I just happened to, like I forgot to call init on one of these. Then if we came through, you would notice that, okay, we only get one init call, of course, and we're getting this error message. In this case, I actually put an error message in module two, in both of them that says, you know, just that the module is not initialized, but this could result in a wide range of different crashes, depending on what your modules actually do. So yeah, so that's something we would not wanna do here. And so what we have here is fine, but we might ask ourselves the question, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to call explicitly these init functions. That's actually one of the nice things we get from constructors in some other languages, that initialization code gets run automatically. Every time you allocate a new object, every time you uh, maybe load a library, there's some initialization code that can just automatically be run. And so we remove the possibility of us forgetting to initialize something. That's kind of what we're after today. And Clang and GCC both give us an attribute that can be helpful. So let me show you how this works. So if we go into, let's say module one here, and I just add attribute constructor. So we can add this to our module init. Let's do this with module one and module two. And the idea here is that what we're doing is we're telling the compiler, hey, this, we want this function here to behave in a constructor fashion. Okay, and I'll show you what that actually means here in a second. But so if we come down here and compile this, still compiles, we're still good. But now if we run it, we're gonna see behavior changes just a little bit. Okay, so one thing is you now see that we still have the exact same behavior in main that we saw before, but you're also seeing that both of these init functions are getting called before main, okay? So what's going on? Well, the compiler is seeing this attribute and that's saying, hey, if this is a constructor, that means I want to call it before main is run. Now, like I mentioned before, remember that this is not standard C. This is this is gonna work in Clang and GCC, but this is not guaranteed to be portable across all C compilers. And anyway, now the point is, is that we could come in here and now we don't have to explicitly say, I want to initialize this module. Anytime this module is part of a program, it will run its initialization. So like this, you get the init, it's gonna happen before main. So that's great. As long as I don't need to use any of the things in this module before main starts, so which is true in this example, right? All the stuff I'm doing with the modules is happening in main. So this is gonna work great. Now, one thing I wanna point out is that these modules, these init functions are run in a particular order. And you could say, well, where's that order coming from? It's important to remember that that order is not guaranteed, right? So in this case, I believe what's going on is it is just taking them in the order that I specified them in in the linker stage. So let's just try something. Let's just uh, switch this up. So if I change this order and I compile it, now the order is different and you'll notice that the modules are initialized in the opposite order. So they are initialized in this case in the order in which they were listed when I passed them to the linker. So, so that's fine. But the point is, is when you're using these constructor attributes, you cannot guarantee that this order will be a particular way. And this can be annoying if we're writing a module that is going to be used by other modules. So let's say for example, that module one here, let's say that my module one is going to actually depend on module two. So yeah, so let's say that somewhere in here, 
I'm going to do module two do stuff in the constructor for module one, right? So now we have this dependency, right? These two modules depend on each other. And so now if we come in here and we compile it and we run it, well, okay, so first of all, you're gonna see that yes, module two is using module one or module one is using module two, sorry, numbers are hard. Uh, and this is happening before we're starting out, before things get started. And this is actually just fine because of the order, right? Module two is initialized before module one, so we're okay. But what happens if we revert this back to where it was? And now the order is switched. So if I come in here, now you notice I'm trying in module one to use module two and it's not initialized. So we're getting an error message, right? So we could have problems. And you're gonna see module dependencies like this with uh, anytime you have like a low level module that's handling something like memory allocation or something that is a building block that other modules can actually use, you can run into this problem where you need to initialize those lower level modules first before you start doing things with the other modules that use them. And so anytime you have module dependencies, you wanna be very careful. It's very fragile to say, hey, my code works. You just have to guarantee that you add, that you link them in a certain order. The constructors show up in a certain order. That is really gonna be annoying. So what can we do about this? Well, one thing you'll notice if you look at the documentation for the constructor attributes is that they can also take an optional priority argument. So you can specify lower priority or higher priority values and that can change the order in which they run in theory. Now, in practice, this doesn't really help us very much. And the reason is, well, first, it works only within a single translation unit. So I compile these modules. When I compile them, they're compiling in three separate translation units. And so the priority in one of these translation units is not going to matter in terms of the priorities in other translation units, right? That's not gonna give you any kind of control there necessarily. I mean, it might, some compilers might do that, but you're not guaranteed to get ordering. The second issue is even if priority values did work across different modules, across different translation units, I would have to keep track and know the priority value of every module out there that I might have to work with. And that also seems to be very fragile and error prone, right? Especially if I'm bringing in a module, someone else's module, and they have their own priority scheme, I may have to go through and actually tweak their code and things to make it work with mine. That's going to be annoying. So if we are making a library or module that requires an initialization function be run, and that module might be used by another module's constructor, then what do we do? Well, I mean, this is probably the most portable and safest way to do this. It's not sexy, but like, let's say, we know we're going to need, you know, let's start with module two because that's the one that module one depends on. So if we come down here, you know, one thing we can do, like I said, not sexy, but I can just say if not module status. So if it hasn't been initialized, then just call module one in it. And so every time I try to use module two underscore do stuff, it's going to check to see if it's been initialized and it will initialize it if it is not. Now this is going to work regardless of the order that our modules are being used and how they depend on each other because we're always, before we use it, we're gonna to check to see if initialization has happened. So just double check if we, oh, but now we have a problem guys. What did I do wrong? Oops. Sorry, module two in it, like I said, one and two, these two modules that differ by just a digit is confusing me. Um, so yeah, so now we're, now we're okay. Now, one thing you will notice here is now module two is being initialized twice because it's being initialized when we first try to use it and then because of this constructor attribute. So if you are going to bother to check this every time, then I would remove the constructor attribute so that initialization only happens once. Okay, so this will work. Now the downside is that now we have this initialization check every time you call this function, okay? And that is going to be a bit annoying. It is going to incur just a small performance cost every time you call this function. And so if this is something that you're gonna do over and over and over again, you might want to rethink whether this is something you want in there. Maybe there is a way that you could statically allocate things, um, I don't know. Now there are some games we can play with function pointers and other more advanced topics if we really don't want that if statement to be run every time time, but I am going to leave that for a future video if you want it, because that gets a little bit crazy. But for today, I hope you learned something new. I hope this is helpful. I hope it helps one of your projects. And until next time, I'll see you later.